Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We know that our God is a faithful God, but there are times when we do not sense His presence with us. That is to say that we cannot discern His activity. He seems distant. He does not seem to be watching over us, moving, doing the things that we would expect for Him to do for His faithful followers. And this is exactly what King David is experiencing. And we're going to learn an important lesson, a biblical principle for how we should think and what we should do when God seems far away from us. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms. And now we're ready for Psalm 13, the book of Psalms. And Psalm 13. Now we see here in the opening inscription what's in Hebrew, the first verse, where it says, La Natseach Mizmor Le David, to the chief music director, the choir director, the leader of the worship when this psalm is recited. It says to the chief music director, a psalm of David. Now, this inscription is not highly informative other than to inform us that David, once again, is the author. And let me emphasize that as we read this psalm, David is going through a difficult time, both spiritually and physically. David is under attack from enemies, and he feels alone. He feels as though God has abandoned him. He does not sense God's power, God's presence, God's blessing in his life. And he is confused by that. And he shares that very much in a transparent way. But when David concludes this psalm, we're going to see the principle that we need to base our life upon. So look with me as we continue in verse 2 of the Hebrew text where it says, and there's going to be a phrase, and it's an idiom that is going to repeat many times. It is going to introduce many different sentences. And in Hebrew, it's ad ana. Probably the best way to understand that in English, and remember, it is an idiom which means until when? Now, there is another Hebrew idiom, ad matai. And normally what the sages of Judaism tell us, that ad matai is a cry for the, the messianic work of Messiah to take place to establish the kingdom. But perhaps here this similar but different Hebrew expression, ad ana has to do with God moving, not necessarily to establish his kingdom, not sending his Messiah, but simply sustaining his people in the midst of this present day reality that we are living in a fallen world. And there are many who stand in opposition to the truth and the purposes of God. And because of that, we find ourselves being attacked, we find ourselves encountering enemies that want to harm us and to hinder what we are doing for, for God. And this is what David is saying. Look again at this next verse. He says, Unto when, O Lord, will you forget me? And the last word is Nesach. Nesach is a word for 
ever. And in this context, it probably would be best translated as, How long, O Lord, will you forget me continually? David sees, and this tells us that this is not just a moment in time, something that David's going through temporarily, but this is something, this word tells us, Nesach, that David feels as though he's been going through this for a long period of time. Not just a matter of days or weeks or a month or two, but much longer than this. That he feels alone, that he's not experiencing God's provision, God's insight, God's illumination, and he feels alone. And here's the key. David is feeling desperate. Desperate for God to manifest himself in his situation. So he simply says, how long, O Lord, until when are you going to continuously forget me? Second part of this verse, it begins again with that same expression, ad ana, until when, and notice what he says here, will you hide your face from me? Now again, this is an another idiom. When God hides his face, it is a removal. This is how David perceives it. This is based upon what David is experiencing, that God's presence is removed. But normally when one beholds the face of God, that is an idiom that, that conveys blessing. So David is saying here, I feel alone. I do not know your provision. I'm not experiencing your activity in my life. And there's an absence of blessing. David is not experiencing a blessed life. Quite the contrary. It is as though God has willfully concealed his faith, meaning face, meaning removed blessings. Will not bless David. And does this mean that David necessarily is in disobedience? Quite the contrary. Many see this as a time, and we don't know this for sure, but when David is experiencing loneliness, having fled from Shaul, that is Saul. Now, nothing in the text tells us other than David has a primary enemy, and he also has secondary enemies. We'll see this in a moment. But nevertheless, David feels abandoned, alone, empty of God's provision, and as though God has removed his blessings from David's life. So he says, until when, how long will you conceal or hide your face, idiom for blessings, from me? Next verse. Again, begins with that expression, ad ana, until when, and here, again, this is full of idioms. It literally says that I will place counsels in the plural in my soul. Now, what does that mean? Well, almost all the commentators see this as David taking counsel within himself meaning going over and over in his mind his situation. Why is he suffering this way? Why is he going through these things? And why is he doing it alone? He does not have counsel from God. He is alone, empty, and confused spiritually. Therefore, he's simply going over and over in his mind. What's Why is this happening? What am I going through? What's the purpose of this? So he says, how long until when? And the idea here, am I forced to simply go through this, handle this on my own? And what is he experiencing? Well, notice this next word, yagon. Yagon, probably one of the most frequent ways that it's translated is with the word sorrow. 
But this also is a word that not only speaks about sorrow, but a sorrow that wears someone down. In other words, David feels as though he's at a breaking point. And notice what it says. We read it in Hebrew, yagon, this sorrow, intense sorrow, bil vavi yomam, which means this intense sorrow is in my heart. And the next word means each and every day. There's no change. Sorrow from sorrow to sorrow to sorrow. It fills his heart. And remember, biblically, a heart is, is what we think with, as a man thinketh with his heart. So David is saying, I can't stop thinking about the sorrow that fills my life day in and day out. And again, we need to remember that key word netzach, which means not just day in and day out for a short period of time, but this is something that David has experienced for a long and extended period of time. Now, David, we know that he is the Lord's anointed. God has given him an awesome position of leadership and responsibility. And now David, having done, we see no issue of there's sin in some way in his life that he's being called to repent from, and that's the problem. The text doesn't say that. It's not an issue of David in disobedience, but rather David is suffering and perhaps for righteousness. It's because David has said yes to God. I will be used by you. I am committed to your purposes. I'm going to stand for your truth and I'm going to do your will. And it's because of that that David is having this, this unleashing of sorrow, suffering, despair, emptiness, and feeling totally alone or abandoned from God. Now, this is a very intense, it's short, but a very intense psalm. Look on to verse 4 in the Hebrew text where it says, Habita. Now, this is a word to look upon something. But we have a couple different words in Hebrew. We have the word lerot, which means to see. The word listachel, to look upon. And lehabit is a word which means to gaze upon something. And usually that word implies more intensely. It's to look with scrutinizing, looking with an expectation to discern something. So David is making this prayer, and he's saying, God, I want you to look intensely upon my life. I want you to know my situation. So it implies here that David is saying, examine me, God, and move in response to my situation. Now, it's in the imperative, and when we make an imperative, which is the the grammatical designation for a command, but when it's in regard to God, it is a request with, with great sincerity and seriousness. So he says, look, and I wrote down as I was doing research and studying other of the rabbinical commentators, it says here how to understand this, tit bonen be mitzavi, which means to pay close attention to my situation. That's what David's requesting urgently from God. So he says, look, and then he says, aneni. Now, this is a word, and I'm amazed. I believe the New American Standard and the King James says here, but it's not the word here. It is a word for a response. So David is saying, Look upon my life, my situation, examine me thoroughly, and then respond. Answer my situation. He wants a response from God. Now, we learn something very important in this, this verse. 
We are all in need of God's activity in our life. We need God to move, to help, and to respond to our situation. That is the best thing that we can hope for, what we should be looking towards, a response from God. And that's what David is saying. Respond, answer this request that I'm making. He says, O Lord, my God. And I would underscore, underline, and what's interesting, this, this nuance that I'm going to be speaking about is seen with just one letter in the Hebrew text. And that letter shows a, a, it's a possessive pronoun. What does that mean? Simply the word in English, my. David is affirming that the Lord, meaning the Lord God of Israel, is his God. He says, O Lord, my God. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's important because this extended period of sorrow, trouble, anxiety, pressure, attacks, and we're coming to this from the enemy. Despite all of this, and David feeling alone and abandoned, absent of God's provision, absent of his blessing, nevertheless, that has not changed. And here's the key. David's covenantal commitment to God see David is not saying you are my God if you do one two and three if you respond in this fashion no David is not even telling God how to respond he simply wants God's activity in his life that's what he's longing for to experience to perceive to see the effects of God's moving in his life so he simply says, look intensely at my life, pay strong attention to what's going on, and God, respond. He doesn't tell him how to respond, but just move, be part of my life. And he's basing that upon his covenantal commitment where he says, O Lord, my God. David's allegiance, David's commitment to the God of Israel, is not based upon God's response, what God's going to do, God's blessing. It's based upon who God is. So he says, look and respond, O Lord my God. And then he says something else. Look at the next part of this verse. ha ira enai The subject is my eyes, the eyes of David. And that next word, ha Ira, this is a word for illumination. What he's saying here when he cries out, ha ira, what he's crying out for is illumination. David wants to understand what he's going through, what's happening, and he wants to understand it based upon God's illumination. In other words, David is saying, give to me your perspective i want to see things understand things from your vantage point now this affirms something that what david is going through there's a purpose a divine purpose god has a plan god has a reason for david in this situation and let's make it personal we all go through difficult times sometimes those difficulties are short a few hours, a few days, a week, month, but other times they are extended far beyond a few months, maybe a year, a couple years, or even longer. A person can have a strong desire for something, wanting a spouse, wanting a child, and that might be something that they have wanted for decades and they come to the conclusion, I'm not going to probably get married I, I'm not going to have a child of my own I've moved past that time I'm not going to achieve this dream I'm not going to accomplish this objective and then in times like that instead of giving up we need to as always 
seek God to give us illumination, His perspective. There's a reason for it. Now, if we're blessed, we'll learn that reason. But sometimes we won't learn that on this side of heaven. But nevertheless, God is still God. He's the Lord, and He's got a purpose for it. So David says, nevertheless, and this is a wise prayer to make, God, give me your perspective. He says, my eyes illuminate. Why? Lest I sleep the death. Now, it's interesting because we see here, and this is important for other purposes, other theological studies, but we need to see that biblically, there is a connection between sleep and literal death. And the reason for that is, and I've mentioned this before, but, but it's so difficult for some people to see this biblical truth, and that is this. Frequently in the scriptures, the Bible likens death, literally death, to sleep. And it's not in any way speaking about a false doctrine of soul sleep. Nowhere in the scripture do we see that. In fact, every time a dead person is, is referenced in the scripture, they speak. They have awareness. So when we look, for example, of, of Samuel having died and Saul speaking, whether this is a, a false representative of Samuel or not, there is communication. We see as well in, in the book of Luke, we see that conversation between Abraham and the rich man, that there's speaking, there's communication. In no way is this a parable. It's seen as a narrative. So we don't see anything in the scripture speaking about someone dying and being in a state of comatose and not knowing anything and just sleeping. We don't see that. So here when it says, I sleep the death, meaning this, David is saying something. He's saying death, what the scripture affirms over and over, is like sleep in the sense of this. You lay down to sleep, there's an expectation that you'll rise up the next day. And in that same way, when sleep is likened to death in the scripture, it's to encourage the reader that, that death is not the end. We should expect to rise up. We should expect a resurrection, which means a kingdom. The kingdom of God will be established. So what David is saying is this. He says, I have no doubt whatsoever about a kingdom reality, but his prayer is not for the kingdom. His prayer is for this world. David wants God to move, God to respond, God to give him illumination, understanding his perspective, so that David can live fruitfully, can live obediently, can live victoriously in this age. He doesn't want to die and simply have a kingdom hope, but he wants to be useful now. And that's what he's saying. If, if you don't respond, if you don't move, I'm going to die. And that's going to end my, my ministry in this world. Now, sometimes that's God's will. God wants to move us on, that we have ended our, our call here. But David is saying this is not his, his belief concerning his predicament at this time. Let's move on. He says, lest my enemy should say, I have finished him. I have brought him, meaning David, to his end. So David, in this verse, tells us he's at a very desperate and difficult position in his life. If God does not move, if David doesn't have illumination, if he doesn't know how to respond by God responding to him, he is going to die. And he says, in light of that, that is going to cause my enemy to, to remark that I have brought David, I have completed him, I have finished him up. He says, and my 
enemies. So when we look here, we have the word oivi, which is my enemy. And then here we have the word sarai, which would be a synonym for enemy, maybe opponents, those who are antagonistic towards David. He says, my opponents, that they should be made to rejoice, meaning it's all about them finishing me. That's what they want. They don't want me alive. They don't want me taking the stand. They don't want me doing these things. And if I die, if they are victorious in their objective to bring me to my end, it is going to cause my opponents to rejoice because I will be, and the idea here is moved. It's a word for collapsing. It's a word that, that speaks about a change in location. And when we put it in a different form, it's just that, to be made to collapse, not being able to withstand the, the attacks of the enemy. And as I said, this tells us David has opposition, he has enemies, and he is at a critical time in his life. So what does he do? Well, now let's move, and in the Hebrew text, it's the last verse, verse 6. And I would say it's the most important verse. This is where the wisdom, the, the principle is found. Notice what, what David says. Va'ani and I, and this first word, it's literally one letter in the biblical language. It's the Hebrew letter vav. And mostly it's translated and, it's a conjunction, so and. But, but oftentimes we need to understand it with the English word but. In modern Hebrew, we would probably translate it with the word aval, meaning but in contrast to. What is David going to do in light of this? Well, he's not going to change. He's going to do what he always does. And this is wisdom and advice for us. He says, but I in your grace, I have trusted. Nothing's going to change him. This is where David is saying, I have confidence. Because I've made a right decision. I've done the right thing. I have put my trust in the grace of God. And again, God's grace, yes, it saves, but God's grace has an anointing, a power, a purpose to bring about the will of God. And I believe that David is convinced here that this is not his end. His end has not come, meaning he does not feel that he has completed God's purposes. And therefore, he says, I have trusted in your grace. And therefore, he says, my heart will rejoice in your salvation. Now, again, we saw this last week, and we're seeing it this week. There is a connection between grace and salvation. How should we understand salvation in this case? Victory. So through the grace of God, it produces for a kingdom reality, salvation, that I'll enter into the kingdom of God, that I'll have that eternal relationship with him. But it also brings about a fulfillment of the will of God, the purposes of God in my life. So he says, I find joy. I will rejoice. My, my heart will rejoice in accomplishing your will. That's what salvation is about. And notice salvation, how it leads one. Notice the end of, of this, this psalm. Asherah, which is, I will sing. And everyone agrees, this is a, a word of worship. I will sing unto the Lord. Worship. This situation, this sorrow, this sense of being abandoned by God and seeing the enemy overcoming David, that's his situation. Doesn't stop David from what? Worshiping God. And that is an important principle. Stand firm in the grace of God. Expect God to 
renew, reestablish, and position us and provide for us so that we can accomplish his purpose. And in the midst of that, waiting for that, what do we do? We worship God. The enemy only has victory over you if he can get you to stop worshiping God. It doesn't matter what goes on in your life, no matter how bad perhaps, and this isn't the case here with David, but there are times when I fail, I mess up, I let God down. And what does God want me to do at times like this? Worship him. Because God is worthy, it is proper to worship him, even in the midst of my failures. God is still God. He's still worthy of worship. So don't let the enemy get you to say, well, God doesn't want to hear my worship. I'm not in a spiritual uh, uh, situation where I can worship God. That is false. All you need to do, confess sin and turn to God looking and receiving his grace and worship him. That's what is a requirement to worship. So he says, I will sing to the Lord for, and this is a statement of faith, for he, and it's the word gamal. Gamal is a recompense. It is a action that God has done. And it's saying there, David is saying, for God has acted unto me. Now, maybe not in this situation, but he has in the past, meaning he has brought me into a covenant relationship. And because I'm in this, and hear this, if it's the new covenant through the blood of Messiah, it is an eternal covenant. And here's the good news. The good news is God maintains that covenant. It is his responsibility. Read the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, what Jeremiah teaches about the new covenant. It is an eternal covenant that God maintains. And it's God's faithfulness. And that's what David is saying here. God, you have been faithful. You've established this covenant. I'm with you. I will worship you. I will praise you. I will sing to you because of what you have already done, that you have acknowledged me. You have redeemed me. You have purchased me. I belong to you. That's what we need to remember. That we are God's purchased possession. And what did he pay? The very blood of his only begotten son to redeem me and place me in a kingdom covenant, an eternal covenant. And as Messiah says in the book of John, no one, no one can pluck us, take us from the hand of God. And that gives us assurance. Let me close with this. I do not know why it is so hard for people to accept this assurance, this eternal security. What is in a person's mind that causes them to say, you know what? God, yes, he's made in a covenant with me. Yes, he's given me eternal redemption. Yes, he's given me eternal life, but... You know what? I'm not so sure. Something might happen that, that causes God to just let go. God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And here's the message. And perhaps one of the reasons why people have such poor theology in regard to this is this reason. Because they do not understand the covenant that God made with Israel. They have been wrongly taught that God has let go of Israel cast them aside, replace them. And therefore, if you believe that, you're going to have poor theology about the new covenant as well. Here's the conclusion. In spite of what you may be going through, and in spite of how long you may be going through it, worship God. Rest in His grace. Allow that grace to work out God's will in your life. Praise him, worship him, and you're going to experience his salvation. And when I say salvation here, I'm speaking about victory in this world and victory in the kingdom of God, being with him forever and ever. I'll close with that. Shalom.
from this room. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.